we are live. Welcome to Ms. Marvel Episode 4 Thoughts. Now, the Netflix MCU shows are now on Disney+. Plus. I won't be doing them right away, but I will definitely do them. I really love the flight. That poor guy sitting awkwardly in between mother and daughter talking about personal drama. And Kamala's mother does explain why she agreed to this. And we see the text messages. I really love the cousin welcoming party. All these family members so happy to see each other. And Kamala remembers the people, the dog, from when she last saw them. And I like the detail of, you know, this episode has two mother-daughter relationships with, you know, Nani and her daughter disagreeing on painting the house. The older one believes it adds to the charm that it hasn't been painted. The younger one thinks it should be more newly painted. And we find out that Nani, you know, draws pictures to remember what they lost during partition. And... Yeah, yeah so there's... I, I'm pretty sure they put some filter on you know, over the footage from Pakistan, as others have pointed out, thankfully, it's not the really heavy kind of, you know, filter that we've seen in a lot of, yeah. You know, according to the show, Pakistan is not worse than America, it is different. You know, one thing is the, the heat, for example, so the, the filter helps underline that. And I love, you know, Kamala does not love how casual Nani is about the, you know, her being a jinn, but I do. I think it was really great. And, and, you know, I think it was new rock stars pointed out, you know, she says, it's just genetics. And, you know, he says, oh, it's jinn ethics, technically. And, you know, Nani points out, you're focusing on the wrong things. The last time the bangle was used, it saved my life. And the guy on the plane and Kamala's cousins both ask about the baby sloth. She keeps insisting it's a napping pillow. You know, she didn't bring that much from Jersey, but she did bring that. I love the look on Kamala's face when she hears that her mother used to be quite the rebel. And... Yeah, like, I don't know with 100% certainty if they went to Pakistan. If they didn't, they did a remarkable job recreating parts of it. It really feels like we're there. A, B, C, D, Instagram. And he spells out what he means by it. And she already knew. And he thought she knew. American-born confused Desi. And I like, I, I thought all the action in this episode was good. Um, you know, the first one happening when she finds the train station. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that this is not one of those shows that has to compete for viewer attention with, you know, oh, there's going to be a, an ad break every seven minutes or so, so we got to have something exciting. You know, for the first chunk of this episode, it isn't, you know, it's not like tense or something. It's just pleasant, you know. So there's a greater contrast between that and then when the action happens. How do you know I'm not Canadian? Because the actress is very cute. Nobody likes the outfit, huh? And I like that, you know, she's like, where'd you learn to jump? Uh, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Where did you learn to jump? Donkey Kong. And, yeah, we see, you know, he attacked her because he thinks she's clandestine. He's not used to people. He's not used to jinn who aren't clandestine. Come with me if you want to live. Is it too early to say that I really love this ca character referencing Terminator 1? Tell me, was it difficult to find a scarf long enough to cover that big mouth of yours? She's so great. 
and we're f we we're told that clandestine will destroy this universe very incursiony. And now that they aren't outnumbered, the clandestine easily escape the DODC, even though they start chained up. You know, so some people said that that kind of makes the DODC not ah it it undermines how effective they're supposed to be because um Tim Roth's character I love that movie I can't believe I'm blanking on his uh abomination abomination you know dipped out of there for a fight at the uh, I forget if it has a name but the the fighting tournament in Shang-Chi the Legend of the Ten Rings I don't know. I feel like the um, they they're they've been shown to be extremely effective. So I I don't know. He made his choice. Now he has to live with it. <clears throat> I like Nani pointing out that she's still trying to figure out, you know, who she is. And Kamala's worried the food is spicy like the other one, but she does seem to like this food. And, you know, she didn't realize that by wearing jeans, she wouldn't be able to enter that yet. I know that happened a bit earlier in the episode, but yeah, you know, she's used to wearing jeans. She didn't think that that would be a problem. And we get to see Nimnani and her daughter, the latter cleaning up. I really appreciate the relationship with between them. They dip into Hindi every so often. They talk about issues that go back decades. And it really is like, you know, of course they would still have these issues. You don't forget these things. They, you know, they come to the surface now that they're together again. Kamala surprised how her mother is behaving. At first, I thought she was a djinn posing as her mother, since in the comics, at least Kamala can change her appearance using the powers. You know, for those who don't know, one of the very first things she does is actually change her appearance to look like Carol Danvers, including the skin tone. So, yeah, I could imagine that some of the other djinn... We haven't seen it so far this show, but yeah. And the clandestine attack the Red Dagger hideout. And Walid is an amazing fighter. So the reason they were caught at the end of the last episode was so Kamala could would get a head start in Karachi. I will say, I mean, it would have been super awkward if they just like boarded the same plane and they're just sitting there like, um, send, you know, shooting daggers out of their eyes, like, just wait at the moment we get, you know, like like high school bullies doing class or something. That would have been, yeah. And, you know, she did need to spend some time in Karachi. You know, that was some, that was clearly important to the people making this show. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had so much of, I mean, just maybe 20 minutes of this episode pass before there's a single action scene. So, you know, at least 15, I would say. So, yeah. And the fight leads into a car chase with the bad guys having a truck, the good guys using a smaller vehicle. For part of it, there are two good guys, people, on a motorcycle. A good guy hits a bad guy using a truck. Leads into a foot chase, makeshift explosive. Very Terminator. I mean, I already knew that at least someone making this episode was a big fan, or they would not have made the Come With Me If You Want to Live reference. But yeah, another great action scene. I, I think... Overall, the so far the the show has better action than a lot of the. Uh, no, no I, th I think I'll wait until I've watched the entire show before I. Anyway, very Assassin's Creed when they parkour on buildings, and more fighting. They think they're making a last stand, but the bang when the bangle is hit by the clandestine leader. I I can't keep track of all these names. Kamala is sent back to the partition and gets on top of the train. And, you know, she's almost got that. That's, you know, the, the uh, wide shot where she's small in the frame was when I realized she's almost got her comic accurate costume by now. The mask, the red and blue clothes, lightning bolt and scarf are really the only things left. And, you know, some people have pointed out 
Maybe it's going to be Walid's red dagger scarf since, you know, as, as a way to honor him. That would make a lot of sense. So, yeah, I saw some people saying the clandestine were defeated too easily at the end of the last episode. I hope they felt this episode helped make up for that. So, yeah, you know, I think in the video I did for episode three, I was wondering if the DODC would do something important near the end of, like, every episode, you know, since they do in the first three. Ultimately, they didn't, but failing to contain the clandestine earlier than the ending certainly is very important. Yeah, honestly, the the once the clandestine attack in this episode, it gets very MCU action, you know, it long action scene. So, yeah, but, you know, I love it. Another episode I absolutely loved. Super excited to see what the last two are going to bring. Now, let's see. So there was, yeah, for so long, a lot of Americans have thought of Muslim women as these silent, put upon, hit by their husband, afraid of their husband. It is true of some, but it's also true of a number of white conservative women. I really love that here we have a show with multiple smiling Muslim women, including married ones. If, if you still have that perception of Muslims, all I can say is you've never worked alongside them, gone to school with them, that kind of thing. Muslim women can feel and express a lot of happiness under the right circumstances. They're not even remotely subtle. You know that noise Xena the Warrior Princess makes when she attacks Ululation? That's what at least some Muslim women sound like when they're really happy. When there's at least a half a dozen of them, the sound carries. I could hear them in another room from a good 30 meters away. Like, I, I don't think, you know, the, the doors weren't closed or anything, but still, that's a, it's, yeah. Like, honestly, in my personal experience, the, at times, they can, you know, be a lot happier and really be, like, stay in the happiness for longer than a lot of white people. The other day, I was headed home from grocery shopping, and I saw a young woman who had uh, a, a, a veil covering her, uh, he a head covering. I, I am not 100% sure. It wasn't like a niqab, it, but yeah, it, it was, you know, for sure, she is Muslim. And on top of it, a graduation hat. And I love that. She's assimilated enough to pursue higher education, but not lost her identity or culture in the process. I know some people think that something should be done about Muslim women <clears throat> covering their hair, at the very least in Western democratic countries. I only agree when this is approached from a progressive perspective. And the message is that it's important that Muslim women here don't feel forced to wear a veil. If the girl or woman herself feels that she would prefer not to wear it, there should be someone that she can reach out to, to talk to her family if necessary. Not threats, just calm and reasonable talk. Not like consequences, but just trying to help them understand. I don't think it's something that should be pushed on these women. And I would argue that anyone who comes at it from a conservative point of view and says, oh, you know, if they're in one of these countries, they shouldn't be allowed to wear, you know, they shouldn't be allowed to cover their hair. Is, that's substantially worse than if they were just allowed to wear it. That's creating problems where there don't need to be any. And I would like to just briefly argue with anyone saying that there's an actual problem with, you know, people covering their hair. It doesn't affect your life in any way. It's not as if they're trying to force you to cover your hair. If they were, I would agree that's a problem. You know, I, uh, let's see, I think if you, if you as a woman enter a mosque, they might ask you to cover your hair and take off your shoes and like wash your face and you you know but other than that you know and that's that's their property you know now let's see but yeah you know if they were i would agree that's a problem once again it should be solved with a conversation nothing stronger than that and let's please not pretend like where you know covering your hair is some kind of absolutely absurd idea that in no way resembles laws in Western democratic countries. Right now, the law in a lot of these countries say that it is not okay for a woman to bear her nipple in public. Don't get me wrong. I agree it should not be legal to get your genitalia or bare ass out in a public place, but a woman's nipple is only sexual if we sexualize it. You know why a number of straight men look at a woman's breasts as erotic? 
Because when you boil it down, sexual arousal for straight people, keeping in mind there's nothing wrong with sexual arousal in general other than, you know, pedophilia and incest, is the lizard brain saying, this is a person you should procreate with. Looking at a woman's breasts might be a way to help determine if she can breastfeed, if she, you know, in, in general, like, if she is curvy, she is more likely to make it through the, the birth and be, and, and be able to take care of the kid afterwards. You know, th there's nothing, like, seeing a woman's nipples and being like, yeah, because cause at that point, like, you might as well say, well, you know, some people are foot fetishists. Does that mean that you're not allowed to, like, now that it's hot, you're not allowed to wear sandals without socks? You know, come on. Because once again, you know, a, a woman's breasts and a woman's feet, you know, some people find them attractive to look at, some people don't. So it's, yeah, anyway. As long as that's a law, as long as people are uncomfortable seeing a woman's nipple in public, we really can't judge other people in our countries for covering more of their bodies than we are used to. It's the same exact principle. They just go further than we do. And besides, it's not like looking at a woman's hair can't lead to, to you know, Women's hair is, you know, I'm a straight guy, I do find women's hair attractive. Not, like, distractingly, but that's because I'm used to seeing women's hair, you know. Like, there are people who are nudists, and they're not, like, I don't know, going around killing people or, or losing their minds or something. It's all about what you're used to and the environment you're in. But, yeah, I have made my point. Cannot wait to see how the, I, I, this is a show that keeps completely pulling the rug out from underneath me. I did not expect the clan, to, I, let's see, for, for one, you know, the whole gym thing, for a while, I was not sure how they were gonna, cause like, I, not everybody hates the Inhumans, and me personally, I don't have a problem with the Inhumans, but I, f I forget who, but someone pointed out the, you know, Kamala Khan is, like, the one Inhuman that, like, a lot of people actually like. You know, the, the Inhumans were basically created to... Ah, let's see. I don't know how much detail I want to get into here, but yeah. They were supposed to be, like, the X-Men. The X-Men made it big, you know. There's a lot of popular X-Men, but there really aren't that many popular Inhuman characters. So, if you're gonna bring in one Inhuman, the question, you know and the MCU has always adjusted stuff from the comics, the question is, are you going to bring in the other Inhumans, or are you going to change it, you know? And, you know, yeah, the, the, we, we got Carol Danvers, but we did not get the other, you know, they did, they had Marvel in there, but, you know, the, the, um, uh, gender swapped, I guess, I think Marvel in the comics was male, but yeah, you know, in the comics, Carol Danvers is not the first Captain Marvel, so, you know, and they kind of, they just didn't want to do the other Captain Marvels, you know, the, yeah, yeah, so, so, we weren't sure if they were just gonna say, oh, she's not an Inhuman, Inhumans aren't a thing in the MCU, <sighs> you know, because the, they did try, they tried to make it a thing, they tried to make Fetch happen, and Fetch did not happen. You know, that I, I think it is on Disney Plus, the the miniseries, but like I I don't know that it's that very many people are going back and watching it. I'm not sure very many people watched it when it first came out. So yeah. We weren't sure if they were gonna make her inhuman, and now the like the djinn are not quite so you know, they they're they're changing up stuff. And the, the clandestine, like, there is a group called clandestine in the comics, but they're very different. And then, like, they go from helping her to attacking her, and, you know, now there's time travel. And it's this, th you know, and, and, you know, people are already theorizing, you know, did she create another an alternate universe? Because her very presence certainly should change things. 
it, it, it would be basically impossible for her not to change something. You know, did she create a new, new timeline like in Endgame? Or is this a different kind of time travel? The the whole yeah, and and I will say the one thing I believe it was Jesse Jenner who pointed out Disney please don't screw up depicting the the I can't believe I'm blanking on the um partition. You know, please do not screw up depicting the partition. You don't have the world's best track record for being very sensitive to sensitive subjects. That is, like, the one thing where I'm like, you know, yeah, a little, little worried, but at the same time excited. But yeah, so, yeah. That is it for this video, and I will catch you next week.